This is the Tom Bigby Tales, and I'm your host, Shannon Evans. I write about a small town along the Tom Bigby River in northeast Mississippi called Columbus. And sometimes I write about the surrounding areas and most of the rest of the state, if it so strikes me. This episode is a continuation of a discussion on the MDAH grant that was submitted by Nancy Luke Carpenter for the Tennessee Williams Building, which is the visitor center in Columbus. And Carpenter is the director of the Columbus Visitors Bureau, as well as, for a time being, the interim, the director of the uh, foundation as well. She'll be moving to the foundation full-time and leaving the Columbus Visitors Bureau by the end of March. The recent grant application by the Columbus Cultural Heritage Foundation has been procured by the Tom Bigby Tales, and its contents are disturbing for what it contains and for what it omits. The total amount of the project of money requested for renovations on the Tennessee Williams Building is projected at $270,348.44, with a grant request of $216,278 from the MDAH, the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, and a 20% matching share of $54,069.99. The MDAH grant directions on page 5 clearly states the project coordinator for the project cannot be reimbursed via the grant for their time and efforts. However, the project professional, in this case, the architect, can be. The grant submitted contains a line, supervision reimbursed at $23,742. Yet there is also a line for an 8% design fee totaling $19,139.71, that would clearly be for the architect. So either the architect is double dipping and getting the supervision reimbursement as well as the design fee, or Brenda Willis, the foundation board president and designated project coordinator, is earning dollars not allowed under the grant guidelines. This leads to the next portion of the application, the matching grant. Per the application, the City of Columbus will be providing a $54,069.69 matching share. Per page 6 of the application guideline, the match must be in hand, meaning the dollars must be in hand at the time of the application. And evidence of it in a bank statement must be provided in the application packet. The City of Columbus document included in the packet includes a letter from Mayor Keith Gaskin that states he's committed to working with the City Council to identify the monies in matching share, that 54000 plus. Not that he had it in hand or that it was even a done deal with the City Council. This letter is merely a promissory note, potentially, and it is dated the 27th of September of 2023. Does the city council, already struggling to fund city projects and police and to keep the lights on in their own offices, know the mayor, put them on the hook potentially to come up with $54,000 plus unannounced? Was this brought before the city council? Was it voted on? Was it presented as a potential expectation of their budget? What happens if the city council refuses to fund the match if it hasn't been brought before the council yet, as it would be their right? Where does the broke Columbus Cultural Heritage Foundation come up with the almost $60,000 then? Well, that's a good question. Remember, the Tennessee Williams found, uh, building is, is 
owned by the Columbus Cultural Heritage Foundation. And they only have a budget this year of $100,000. A great deal of that goes to the keeping the lights on in the building. And the rest goes to pay for uh, salaries of docents. So it's unclear to me where they're going to come up with any extra money because they just don't have it. An additional yet significant piece of the application packet is also missing. At least three letters of support are required. However, only two are included. One is from the mayor in addition to his letter, his promissory letter. The other is from Dixie Butler, a former board member and friend of director Nancy Carpenter. Mrs. Butler's letter is unique because it reads almost identical to the content about Columbus on the Visit Mississippi website. Add to that, Mrs. Butler <clears throat> is visually impaired. The document is not signed. And currently, we can't even question Mrs. Butler if she did write this letter because she's in nursing care at a local nursing facility. There is absolutely no third letter, as is required by the requirements of this grant. How did this get past the MDAH Grant Committee? Usually, a very detail-oriented review process exists there. So was it because Carpenter is a member of their board, or and on that night she was elected their vice president? Who knows? But let's get back to the overpadded budget. This is far more interesting. The budget includes $3,000 for insurance, which is odd. I've never seen a project budget that pays for something that contractors already must carry as a cost of doing business. There's also a bond of $7,000 listed in the budget, which is a really high amount for a bond. Then there's a line that says taxes, $22,353. The Columbus Cultural Heritage Foundation is a nonprofit, and all their nonprofit paperwork is included in their, in their grant application packet. So it would seem that they would be exempt from taxes on all purchases, et cetera. So it's unclear to me why taxes are included in their estimate. Another line item that's questionable is the temporary facilities that are listed at $4,906.69, exactly the same amount as a month of expenses for uh, operating the Elks Club across the street. Is that where they plan to hold uh, their their business offices as they do this work on the building? Why do they even need temporary facilities? Can't the docent just shift rooms as they are painted and repaired? Or can they put a tent in the front yard like Nancy Carpenter wanted the historic home tours to use to sell tickets and put, put it up and down every day during last year's spring pilgrimage? Now come to the two amounts that are definitely over the top. $25,000 for latent conditions, meaning fixing any faulty work from previous workers, which is kind of ethereal and just kind of out there. So just in case we find any. And $12,000 for contingencies. That's a lot of contingencies. That's a total of $37,000 for maybes, what ifs, and anything I want to throw in for giggles and grins, including possibly the kitchen sink. $5,036 is set aside for floor protection. That's a heck of a lot of tarps, plastic, and blue painter's tape, if you ask me. $9,352 is designated for demolition. That seems awfully high for front porch removal. Although that could consider that could include dump fees, but even then that seems exorbitant. The new front porch is projected to cost $13,000. Reasonable. And the carpentry labor for the whole project is listed as $36,000, which seems exorbitant for Mississippi. <clears throat> it seems exorbitant for Mississippi. Plaster is projected also high at $7,000. Considering that all the plaster work that has to be done is only patching that's needed not entire rooms, and probably it was either previously patched by the contractor who came in when after the roof leaked, or they should have come in. 
but I digress. An interior painting of essentially four main rooms is going to cost $17,500. Ooh, that seems high. And $25,000 for the entire exterior, also high. But back to funding the project. The foundation has no money, only the building for collateral, and they don't even own it. Why are they continuing to pour so much money into real estate at the foundation and at the CVB? Remember, these groups own an overpriced condo, the abandoned Elks Club, the next door to the Elks Club old muscle white building with the mildewed and tattered window awnings, and the Tennessee Williams home. In 2010, $400,000 was put into the Williams home, and now, another $200,000 13 years later, why is all of this being done with tax dollars? That's the greater question. In most communities, these types of buildings and their maintenance would be done by private funds and fr through private foundations that would own and carefully maintain such historic places. I don't know what's going to become of this, but I can guarantee you this. I will be writing to the MDAH and asking some very difficult questions about this particular grant and its oversight. I'm Shannon Evans, and this is the Tom Bigby Tales.